So I was reading the news the other day and I saw this. So because I am someone who takes communion and because I'm someone who can't have gluten, I have a lot of thoughts and experiences to share on this and so here we are. My first response was a John Mulaney's line from The Comeback Kid. Because that's what needed revamping in the Catholic Church. <laughs> and that was the squeaky wheel that needed the grease. And then I got off my Protestant high horse and actually did some research. So I want to give a little bit of actual information on this because it is not a great habit to read a headline and then immediately form an opinion, which is what I did. I'm not a theologian. I'm an idiot on YouTube and you should look this up if you're curious. Links below. So Jesus is, spoiler alert, about to die and he knows that he's about to die and so he's having what he knows is his last meal with his disciples who are like his friends and mission buddies who he's been like traveling and living and just being with for the past three years. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So that language can be a little like Bible-y if you're not familiar with it. So the covenant is basically like God made a contract with his people at one time to be like, I have a design for the entire universe because I am the creator and I want you guys to be like in community with me in perfection and goodness. And then humans were like, hey, no, I don't want to do that. That sounds dumb. We know better. And God was like, uh, that's a problem because now that you have deviated from this plan, like in some weird laws of the universe I don't fully understand. That means I can't be around you anymore and that is the opposite of what I want. I want to be around you all the time. So he made this contract, this covenant with the Israelites who were like his people to basically say there needs to be something that like takes on this this like toxicness and this burden that you have that is like literally preventing me from being around you the thing that i want most in the world so jesus is basically saying he is like contract 2.0 he is the new covenant meaning meaning that the death of his that is coming up is going to be the taking on of all the like toxicity and and what we call sin and so now instead of following the old law which required things like killing lambs and like having like physical purity by like being rid of diseases and stuff like that. You can instead like recognize your place and that you have done things that have like made you separated from God and that he is no longer able to be around you. That you have done that, that you want to be able to be in God's presence and that you recognize Jesus as like the way to do that. And communion is, is basically like the representation of like the taking of that sacrifice and that acceptance thing that happens. He's basically saying like, hey, when I say this is my body broken, it means I'm literally, my body's going to break and I'm gonna be the thing that takes on all that like toxicity and stuff instead of like sheep and things like that. It's it's weird, but it's also pretty cool. And so that's that whole business. So if you are Catholic and you like take on all of the teachings of the Catholic Church, you believe in something called transubstantiation, which sounds super fancy, but it's just trans, which means change, and then substantiation. So you're changing a substance. So for Catholics, they believe that when you are eating the bread and drinking the wine, that that actually like physically turns into the body and blood of Christ. So if you're a Catholic, the actual substance of the bread and wine that you are consuming are more important than they would be for, say, me. So they set some ground rules to say, here's what you can use in the Eucharist and here's what you can't. By the way, the Catholic celebration of what I call communion is often referred to as the Eucharist. So that's what's going on when you hear the Eucharist. The bread used in the celebration of the most holy Eucharistic sacrifice must be unleavened, purely of wheat, and recently made so that there is no danger of decomposition. The wine that is used in the most sacred celebration of the Eucharistic sacrifice must be natural from the fruit of the grape, pure and incorrupt, not mixed with other substances. But they have some caveats on this is important. There are people who, for whatever reason, can't have gluten, and there are people who, for whatever reason, can't have alcohol. And that's a little difficult, and you don't want to, as a church, like, exclude people. So what you've been allowed to do is drink something called mustum, which is basically, like, was gonna be wine, but they stopped the alcohol thing from happening. It's less than 1% alcohol, but it's still acceptable. The other thing you can use is low-gluten bread, which I read and thought was not I thought it was stupid at first. So I looked it up and what they actually consider valid for the Eucharist is like less than 20 parts per million. This is a million. This is 20. This is the number you get when you divide 20 by a million. And this is that in percentages. It's not a lot of gluten. In fact, you can have less than 20 parts per million of gluten and the FDA will let you say gluten-free on it. And so people who have celiac disease can actually eat one of these 
and be okay. There was a quote from this in the Washington Post article that I really liked. So like the center of celiac research figured out that you need to eat like 270 of these to actually get sick. You'd have to be very devout or really excited about going to church to eat that much at communion. I'm just imagining someone eating like 300 little tiny wafers and just like gulping down grape juice like, yeah, the sacrifice of Jesus. <coughs> Please don't do that no matter what you're allergic to. So that was it, that's the story. And this whole thing for me is like, the actual substance of the story is not that significant, but it did get me thinking a lot, and so I have some thoughts. First of all, the think pieces are terrible. Pretty typical for gluten-free discussions is, oh, by the way, yeah, those people exist, but gosh, gluten-free diets are so stupid. And it would just be really nice to not be a footnote anymore. Like the no gluten thing is way more a part of my life than it will ever be someone's life who is not a celiac. No matter how devoted you are, you have not had the experience of being at a friend's house, them offering you food, and you having the panic of, do I take it and risk getting sick? Do I give it up and risk being rude? Ah! Or eating out at a social event and then having to leave early and then be miserable for three days? Like, nah, man. Like, that is the celiac experience. That is it in its purest form. The paranoia. The stomach pain. The awkward questions. The lack of energy. The furious menu scanning. The emotional turmoil. In conclusion, there's a difference between an autoimmune disorder and a diet. Got a little emotional there, but gluten-free thing is a buzzword everyone seems to want to talk about. And celiac is something that no one seems to want to talk about. And that's my lived experience that I have every day, so it kind of sucks when it's made into like a side note. Like when I went to college, I started going to a church that had no gluten-free communion. So I had to awkwardly stand in line. This is his body broken for you and his blood shed for you and carry my soggy piece of bread into my seat and hold it in my hand for the rest of the service. Cause you don't wanna be that person just standing up and letting everyone walk past you like, oh, I guess who's not taking communion today, folks? Mm, there's something going on there. I'm sure they would not actually be thinking that, but I would think they're thinking that. And it's not worth it. And so one glorious Sunday morning, I'm sitting in my pew. I am ready for the awkward walk down the aisle to get the bread. And the pastor announces, oh, there's a gluten-free option in the back for those of you who need it. I felt so loved! Like, this may seem really stupid. I don't know if someone noticed me with my soggy bread piece, or if, like, someone talked to somebody, or they just, like, happened to do it when I was there, but I was just so happy that, like, they made an accommodation so that I could participate in this thing. Communion is such a beautiful thing. Rachel Held Evans wrote this entire chapter in her book Searching for Sunday about communion. And it was just so beautiful. It was about communion as like a place where people from all different walks of life and not just like, like, oh yes, this very diverse group of middle-class white people. Like rich and poor and black and white and male and female and slave and free and literally everybody is invited. And in the early church, they made some very specific things to be like, you will not prevent people from coming here. You will not even do like a soft, oh, they happen to be at work when we're doing this. You will not get drunk off of this wine. You, that is not acceptable. This is something sacred and everyone is invited. And even people like me who can't have the bread are still invited. I had the experience of having a pastor I know who led a small group have us take communion at her house. So earlier that week we were talking about the whole like grace versus works thing, which is basically like when Jesus saves you, does that mean you just like go out and sin a bunch because you're covered? And so I said, if I were suddenly not allergic to gluten anymore, I would not be super happy because I could suddenly go out and eat pizza and have pasta and eat cupcakes. I would be happy because I don't have to go to a restaurant and worry that I'm gonna be the one eating a friggin' salad while everyone else is like, having decent food, or like be super paranoid that they put croutons on the salad and just took them off but then left a residue behind that's gonna make me super sick. Or that someone who thinks they know what gluten-free is doesn't know what gluten-free is and they made me something and I gotta accept it and it's gonna make me sick and oh my gosh. But if I was covered in that, I wouldn't have to be afraid anymore. Because I'm covered in Jesus, I don't have to be afraid anymore. I don't think she had ever heard someone describe that specific kind of crouton paranoia before, but it got her thinking about why it's so important in the church to make everyone welcome. And she, she goes in the kitchen, comes out with this plastic thing of grape juice and this bag of gluten-free bread. And so she wanted us all to be having communion together from the same loaf that was made for all of us. And that like genuine Christ-like love of like bringing us into her house and like giving us what was available and having her son be running through the room and having us all just like there 
together in this like quiet and holy moment was probably one of my like top 20 experiences ever and it was because something that is talked about so much and that we know is important but we're really bad at doing was actually done to me. It wasn't about any of us, it was about us coming together and about us remembering what Christ did and not having that be this big kerfuffle ceremonial thing but still having it be... I can't explain this. It was really beautiful and it was really hard to explain. I don't think it's something that if you have not experienced God that I can't explain to you. And that's why my first response to that headline was to be angry because my first thought was this is going to prevent people from having that experience. And it's not, and I'm glad, but it still brings up a lot of emotions of the thing that the church does in the name of like biblical accuracy that just works to exclude people. I personally don't see the biblical reasoning for transubstantiation. I personally don't see the reason why it needs to be wheat and it needs to be alcohol. But I do respect that a space was made for people who cannot have those things within the church for them to still be able to participate in this wonderful, beautiful thing. But then it makes me wonder, what if we're not excluding the no wheat, no alcohol people, but someone else. Like, yeah, Jewish culture had wheat bread, but there are lots of cultures that have no wheat or no bread or neither. We call Jesus the bread of life because of this whole communion dealio. But in South Korea, they have a hymn called the rice of life because rice is an essential part of the meal for them. What about cultures where alcohol isn't tolerated? What about places where wine isn't like the default alcohol? Like the belief is that the essence of God is contained in that wheat and that alcohol. And that if you take part of like any part of it, like you can just have bread if you want and that still counts as like the full communion, like the same way that like you can take a skin cell and it still has all your DNA in it. I don't know why the belief is that the gluten and the alcohol are the things that contain Jesus. Very little contain, actually, you know what? Friggin' nothing contains Jesus because Jesus is Jesus. Gluten is literally a chemical. Alcohol, also a chemical. Do you know who made chemicals? I'll give you a hint. And so that's the part that more like irks me, not the part that like is actually relevant to me because the low gluten wafer thing is their way of taking care of me. But what about everybody else? I don't want, just want to say I'm going to be okay because I'm A, not Catholic and B, will not get sick by the low gluten wafers that like, okay, it's all good. Cause like, I don't know if it is all good. Like the whole point literally of Jesus was to bring salvation and like the community of all kinds of people together with God. I don't see why that has to happen with a little wheat wafer. The transubstantiation thing is something that I can concede on. Like that is what we call an open-handed issue, which means like it's not about the big stuff. And so there will be disagreement on it and we can still like be unified in Christ. But there are some things that I can't really quite get over. Communion is the way to have everyone coming together and being with God together, that's the whole point. That's why God sent Jesus, is so that could happen. So we could be there all together. God could be there too. The best thing. The thing that I miss most about the church that I went to with the gluten-free communion was being able to take communion every single week. It was beautiful. So like, if you want to experience it, and you have received Jesus' sacrifice and can be in community with God while you're here on earth, there is nothing that should stop you from being able to take communion. Like, we need to bring this to as many places as possible. So I don't have a super good conclusion on this of what they did was bad, what they did was good, because some of my theology doesn't line up with theirs and so we can't, we're not going to reach the same conclusions. I do respect some of their decisions. The point isn't whether or not you can have free trade coffee or 
whether God is okay with cyborgs. These are interesting questions that should not make you want to fight someone, unless there's something else at play. Like, there are there are questions that should make you want to fight someone. Like, if you want to tell me that we should have free trade coffee at our churches, I will probably be like, yeah, that's a good idea. I think God would be totally on board with that. But if you want to tell me that churches that don't have free trade coffee are all going to hell, I will not be on board with that. If you want to tell me that God hates gay people, I am not on board with that. If you want to tell me that segregation within the church isn't an issue, I am not on board with that. If you want to tell me that Jesus said some smart things, but all of that stuff that he said about him being like the literal son of God who has come to take on our sins is just like, not a thing, I will not be on board with that. Like if you want to tell me you prefer to dress up at church, Go for it. If you want to praise God with a traditional dance, that's fine. If you want to tell me you don't want your kids reading the Harry Potter series for a while, that's fine. And if you tell me you want to take communion with the rice of life, go on ahead. Nah, you're just making things up. Pizza rolls are great. Also, everyone feels sick after they eat. That's normal, right? It's not normal. So, so they, they so, so they put out, so, so they made, so they put, nope. Okay, we're still going. We're still going. Who? Yeah, it's who. Wine. Open hands. Open table. Methodist dance party. Weep, whoop, whoop. Am I still recording? Maybe she has some sin issues in her life. I don't know why they have a southern accent. Are we going? Okay, good. No, wait. Are we, are we actually? Oh, we're going. What? I am a Bible nerd. Yes, I'm a Bible nerd. No, did I run out of room? Ah, no. Oh, it's fine. almost knocked over the track. <laughs> okay. The biblical reasoning for transubstant- oh, frick. I can't believe I'm such a flippin' nerd. Oh, gosh. Oh, shoot. Flippin' Corinthians. I am a fool. Gosh. I'm so flippin' emotional about this. Talk- oh. Beep, boop, beep, boop. Neep, snoop. Boop. There we go. Like, if you wanna tell me God hates gay people, I will firmly disagree with my fists. No, I won't do that, but I will firmly disagree. If you want to tell me that this injustice is happening in the world, but it's not really something that's a church issue or that God cares about, I will fight you! And I come at you not with sticks, but in the name of the God of Israel, who this day shall help me defeat you! We will see who defeats who. Now we fight. It's shut down! <laughs>